Well, this morning, the passages that we read, let's just briefly go back to them as we, as we open our topic this morning. First of all, Matthew chapter 4, 23 through 25. Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of disease, sickness, and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed and epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee, from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Did you notice the emphasis on all? All kinds of sickness and all kinds of people followed him. This is a man who is going through and he is clearing out the hospitals. Of course, they didn't exist, but if they would have existed, understand that when this man, Jesus, the man of God, the man who was God in the flesh, he would have cleared out the hospital. Lancaster General Hospital, Brandywine Hospital, Ephrata Hospital, Children's Hospital in Philadelphia would be cleared out. There'd be no one left. Think about what Faith Healer today can do that. Name two. Name one. Think about it. He healed them all. Going over to our other passage in Matthew 8. We see examples here. Actually three examples of different types of healing. There's something I want you to see though in the beginning of uh, chapter 8. Verse 4. This man gets healed of leprosy. It never happened before. Never happened in Israel. It happened um, to Naaman the Syrian. But it hadn't happened to anyone in Israel. And Christ made that point at a later time. Look at what happens here. And Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go your way and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to, to them. Now, no doubt, the man was thrilled to be healed from his leprosy. But what was the ultimate point of this particular miracle? It was to be a testimony to the priest. Have you ever run into a faith healer who understood even this basic point? That sometimes healing is not about the healed, the one who was healed. Sometimes it's a, it's a means to an end for something else. This was a huge moment here in the history of the Israelite race. For if these priests at this moment, if they would have recognized that a healer, was, something brand new had happened. We have a healing from leprosy here. It's never happened before. Never. And a man came along and healed them. And there was a process that was supposed to happen. A period of quarantining. And the priests were very involved. We don't have time to look at it, but in the Old Testament, the priests were very involved in any any time someone was healed of leprosy. They were involved. And it certainly appears as if they met this man and gave him the back of their hand. Do you realize what could have happened if the priests would have embraced Christ at, that, at this point? See, our, our point this morning is that the healing that Christ did and Paul was always connected somehow with the gospel. Always. As we look forward here, Jesus had entered Capernaum. A centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed and dreadfully tormented. Jesus says, I will come and heal him. Centurion says, uh, not really necessary. Speak the word. Now here we have, shall we say, a remote healing that occurs. Now if you're a faith healer, you're probably really paying attention now, right? <coughs> Even I could get into the remote faith healing business. Hey, you know, I have a testimony of someone in, in Oregon. 
Well, what's different about this? This was a situation that everybody knew. If you're a centurion, you have, you, th this guy isn't his only servant. The whole household knows. Anybody know of anyone who's been healed by a faith healer, by, by, by remote control, if you will? Oh, there's a lot of statements. I've heard the testimonies. I, I've heard the sermons. But I've never witnessed it. This here is a distant healing, but the person was known by the people involved. That's not happening in our modern faith healing situation. Finally then, Peter's mother-in-law. Peter's house. Have you ever noticed that, um, as we pointed out last week, people who healed other people, have you ever noticed that no one ever seemed to be able to heal themselves? Have you ever noticed that? We made that point last, last week. In the case of Peter, when he really needed a miracle, he would be killed. Peter, the miracle worker. Here he is, Peter the miracle. He, Christ comes and heals his mother-in-law. But do we know of anyone who actually healed themselves in the scripture? Why is that? Why is it that John Wimber of Vineyard Ministries, a tremendous healer, supposedly, died of cancer? see, one thing the faith healers tell us is that if you have enough faith, anyone can be healed. But we don't see this here. We don't see faith as a prerequisite in every case. In some cases we do, but not in every one. This week, I heard sad commentary from Pastor Brian Shortley, who was in these circles and told events beyond sad, horrifically sad of people that followed around faith healers, people in wheelchairs, followed them around and heard things like, well, you never know when it's going to be your night to be healed. So they follow them around again and again and deride themselves for not having enough faith because if they just had enough faith like everybody else had, apparently, they could be healed. But Peter, Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law we don't know anything about the faith there. Then ultimately we see this passage coming back around to the gospel. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. They cast out the spirits with a word and healed all, there's our word again, who were sick. All. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness. When Isaiah talks about infirmities and sickness, what's he really talking about? Is he talking about our ingrown toenail? Or does he have something else in mind? Well, that's the topic of our, that's the, the sense, if you will, of our sermon here this morning. Turn with me, if you would, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 27, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed those in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. And after that, miracles and gifts of healing, helps, administrations, variety of, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of, a miracle, of miracles. Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? but earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet I show you a more excellent way. Just by way of review, last week we, we encouraged you to ask the right questions. If I want to go out and grab a real showy gift, like speaking in tongues, am I really fulfilling what Paul is saying here? Paul says earnestly desire the best gifts. And how do we know what the best gifts are? Well, he just told us. In the previous verse, or verses, 
First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and after that, miracles. Earnestly desire the best gifts. And why are these the best gifts? And this, I believe, speaks to the issue of why we have these miracle gifts um, spoken of in Corinthians, and they're not spoken of in the other two lists. They're in Ephesians 4 and in Romans chapter 12. And I believe the reason is, is that without these gifts, teachers, prophets, or speakers forth of the truth, if you will, you can't have the church of Jesus Christ if you don't have that. From John Gill, the Corinthians seemed most covetous and desirous of speaking with different tongues. But the, but the apostle shows, by various reasons, especially in 14.1, which we'll get to in a few weeks, that prophesying was preferable, being more serviceable and useful to the church, and so more eligible and to be desired by them to which he may have regard here. Do you see his point there? It's a point we've been trying to make. Spiritual gifts are not about you showing off. They are about what your neighbor in the church needs and how you can minister to your neighbor in the church. I know it's not real exciting perhaps to have the gift of helps, but it's ministry to your neighbor. Other gifts may not be so exciting, but that's the point. And that's what Gil is saying here. Or else by them are meant the internal graces of the Spirit as faith, hope, and love, which are all of them gifts of God's grace, all useful and valuable, and better than all extraordinary gifts whatever which a man might have and be nothing but lost and condemned or damned. Whereas he that believes in Christ has a good hope through grace and love in his soul to God, Christ and his people. We never see love for God separate from love of his children ever in the scriptures. We never see going off into the mountaintop with John Denver to commune with God all alone. They don't see it. God, Christ and his people, though he is destitute of the other gifts, he shall certainly be saved if he has God in Christ and God's people. Wherefore, these are the gifts which men should be solicitous for and covet after and be greatly concerned to know what they, that they have them and to be content without the other. This is for me, which has been a great challenge for me over the years. As I've watched even members of my own, shall we say, extended family and other friends get, shall we say, caught up, if that's a fair word to say, in these exciting movements where we're all thrilled because we have, a, we have the Holy Spirit here and, and cool things are happening. But as John Gill says, you should really be going after the best gifts here. Apostleship, teaching, and so forth. The prophecy. You see, true miracles exhibit specific characteristics. My job this morning is to help you identify the marks of true miracles. Because the more you believe in false, hear me on this, my friends, the more you accept false miracles as true miracles, then the more confused you will be when a true miracle does occur. We don't have time in our lives to be fooling around with nonsense with fake outs. And there are plenty of them out there. Well, there's some aspects that surround a true miracle. We're going to take a look at John 9. But before we do that, let's look at the real problem here. A real issue. Let's look. At verses 1 through 3 again in chapter 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were Gentiles, you were carried away to these dumb idols. Paul is going to connect false miracles with idolatry. Is he stepping out alone here on this? Think of the first miracle ever that occurred 
or series of miracles. Now we had some miracles, of course, with the manna. We saw that in the wilderness, right? But the first time we really see miracles in, 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 in volume or in quantity was, of course, at the time of the Exodus, right? Now, in order for Moses to gain credibility before Pharaoh and before the children of Israel, who wondered where he'd been for 40 years, apparently, if they even remembered him, you remember that he had two miracles to show, right? Put his hand inside of his cloak, pulled out and it was leprous, put it back and it was not leprous. And then he had the opportunity to throw down his, his, um, his rod and it turned into a snake. And that was that, right? So he goes before Pharaoh and he throws down his rod and it turns into a snake. And that's that. Pharaoh says, okay, now I believe you. Right? Not hardly. Pharaoh comes out with his own magicians who could do their own thing. And there were two of them. You see, this miracle thing is not so easy to figure out all the time. And I've, I've read commentators. I believe this is in your new Schofield Reference Bible. That these rods were actually stiff snakes. Ever seen a stiff snake? Put them in the freezer, stretch them out, put them in the freezer, maybe. And then suddenly they uh, warm up. It takes a, even if they were, it takes a while for a snake, snake to warm up, right? No, they, 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 could, they could do miracles here. They could. You see, we, we need to be discerning here, my friends. What does the miracle lead to? Who does it ultimately glorify? And a very practical point. Are we using healing miracles to make money? That never happened among true disciples. Silver and gold have I none, said Peter. What faith healer today can say that? I want to know. <laughs> wow. Turn to John 9 if you would. John 9... You know, there's always things that, as, as, as a preacher, that we want to help you to remember. If you want to remember, if, if you ever want to go back to a passage in Scripture that, shall we say, stretches out a miracle, it's John 9. John, whose gospel is relatively short compared to Matthew and Luke, takes one whole chapter here to stretch out just one single miracle. John's not doing what we see in Matthew, Mark, and Luke a lot. Jesus comes, he heals the diseases. We don't know very many details. And, he, and, and they just go on to the next verse. But if you want to see a miracle and its effects, the inner workings, shall we say, of those that responded, it's John 9. Go to John 9 for an entire chapter of one single miracle and how it affected folks. Seven points that we're going to get out of this this morning. First point is the ultimate work on the healing of the sin problem. It's the sin problems being attacked here. And that's our first point and our, and our last point. Verses 6 and 7, watch out for anyone who says he has a faith healing formula. Thirdly, true miracles are often the most obvious to those who have the most to lose. Not the most to win, the most to lose. We'll also see that a true miracle will often divide, not unite. We'll see the true miracles expose frauds and liars. True miracles. And once again then, to bookend it again, it's really like six points, but I said them twice. The end goal of healing miracles is the healing of the sin problem. Think about it. Have you really been helped if you've received miraculous healing and still wind up in hell? Think about it. You see, hell for us is just all that far. We live right here. See, we'll be healed right now. Now think about down the road. We're all going to die. 
What are we thinking about that? First of all, the ultimate work in the healing is the healing of the sin problem. Verses 1 through 5. And then we'll see verses 40 through 41 here in John chapter 9. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, teacher, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Uh, the, the, the disciples look pretty bad here, but I think we've all been there, right? Sort of pedantic. They don't really have this man in mind. You know, hey, we're having discussion here, teacher. And, uh, oh, this guy right here is blind. Uh, you know, take him for example. Um, you know, uh, somebody sinned, blind. Some teaching had to be done here. You know who these, the disciples sound like right here, right? They definitely sounds like Job friend, Job's friends. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. What are those works? I must work the work in him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Ah, here we are, here we've identified what Christ is going to be doing here. He's not just in some kind of, he's just not like a presto healing guy. He is the light of the world. What does the light mean? Well, look at verse 41. Start with verse 40. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. And Christ here is, is connecting this statement about the being the light of the world to exposing the sin that's in the world. John especially does that. When John speaks of light, he's not speaking of switching on the halogen bulbs or lighting a torch. He's speaking of Jesus Christ who, when his light shines, the sinners head for the tall grass. Jesus Christ, when he begins this passage here in, in, nine, in, 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 chapter, uh, in, in chapter 9 of John, first identifies his work of healing. Before we, the man is even healed, he's talking about the sin problem first of all. Verses 6 and 7. Watch out for anyone who says he has a faith healing formula. Look at this one. When he said these things, here's a formula for you. When he said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he annoyed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Have you ever considered Christ's formula for healing in the New Testament? Did he have one? Did he ever have a real predictable formula? How about uh, smack them in the forehead and they fall down flat? <laughs> and one thing you know about Christ, and you see this later on with Paul and Peter, they had no formulas at all. My friends, watch out for anyone who says he has a formula, a faith healing formula that works. Because it's not going to work. Thirdly, True miracles are often the most obvious to those who have the most to lose. Now, why do we say this? Because in your modern faith healing um, meetings, it's the people there that have the most to, to gain. And man, they can get in their head, oh, I don't have enough faith, or I think I can get up from my wheelchair and walk. Or I was blind, but now I think I can see a little light. This man came back seeing. You see, our modern meetings, they gather people who are all in favor of what's going on. Oftentimes, Christ healed in situations where they were not in favor of it. Like this one, as we will see. Verses 8 through 15. Some said, this is he. Well, I'm sorry. Therefore, the neighbors, verse 8, and those who previously had seen that he was blind. I love what... I love what John says there, had seen that he was blind. Said, is this not he who sat and begged? Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. He said, I am he. Therefore they said to him, how were your eyes opened? He answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go wash in the pool of Siloam. So I went and washed and I received sight. And they said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. 
Yeah, stop there for a minute. My friends, if you don't understand that your salvation is a work of the grace of God, and not because you were just smarter than your neighbor, and you exercise your little free choice, which you think you have, I, I beg you to understand this, this passage right here. I, I, I beg you to do it. Did you see what just happened? And yes, we do exercise a free choice, and our little free choice hates God and can't run away from him fast enough. Look at this. The man was blind. They, they were getting an argument about whether or not he, he was the guy that was blind. They, and they asked him, said, yeah, I'm that guy. He should know. And they said, well, where is this Jesus? He says, I don't know. So instead of looking for Jesus, they looked at the Pharisees. What is wrong with people? My friends, that's all of us. That's us. Thank God that he reached down and saved us. We, we, this is us. We'd be, we'd be them. This is an amazing thing. We think that we're smart enough. I don't know. We have something special. Our neighbors done that. Our neighbors who are going to hell. But we're smarter or more sensitive or more something. This is all of us here. What an amazing testimony. Where is he? He says, I don't know. Ah, let's go to the Pharisees. Don't you think you'd want to find this man, Jesus? Could it be that they were possibly confused? I don't think so. We read earlier that his fame went everywhere. Some of his neighbors just had to know. They brought him, who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was a Sabbath when Jesus made clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put clay in my eyes, and I watched and I see. See, so verse 15, it kind of looks like he's getting tired of repeating the same thing, doesn't it? It was kind of a longer explanation the first time. It's getting shorter. It's getting tired of the question. I think he was shocked that no one, no one was excited for him. No one, we see no one saying, wonderful, you can see, you've been blind, this is great. No one's saying that. It's sort of more like, a, let's drag him into the interrogation room here. Okay, I don't know exactly, exactly how this happened. Okay. Verse 16, therefore some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. Now, we have to take another minute to see the, the antipathy, the hatred these Pharisees have for, for the works of God. They said this man doesn't keep the Sabbath. Let me ask you something. In this incident, who did the work? What did Christ actually do? All Christ did was actually tell somebody to do something. Not, as far as we know, a violation of the Sabbath, even for Pharisee rules. It was the man who went and washed himself. Who knows how many steps it was. Maybe it was too many steps. Who knows? But Christ is not the one that's breaking the Sabbath here. If anybody broke the Sabbath, it was the man who, who uh, had his eyes, who washed out, who, be, who, be, who began to see. And so, but they immediately conclude that Christ is a Sabbath breaker. Once again, my friends, do you trust your superior reasoning capability to come up with what's true, apart from the revelation of God and his word? Think you can do that on your own? You're that smart? These are the smartest people around and conclude that Christ is a Sabbath breaker and can't figure out that Christ didn't do anything. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. That's a little bit further on down the road. True miracles here. They asked, they asked them. And um, the amazing thing about it is the Pharisees, how, how he had received his sight. You see, the, the, the Pharisees were beyond, the, the, did, what, is this the right man? See, or not? See, in the beginning, among the neighbors, is this the right guy? 
or is this not the right guy? But the Pharisees are beyond that. It was obvious to them that a miracle had happened. You see, the, the miracles that Christ did were often the most obvious to the people that hated him the most. It's opposite of what we see in our faith healing meetings. In our faith healing meetings, the miracles are obvious to those who really, really want it to happen. These Pharisees didn't want it to happen, and they know that a miracle has taken place. The most opposition from those who have the most to lose. In verse 17, look at this. They said to the blind man again, what do you say about him because he opened your eyes? <laughs> These were the spiritual leaders of the people. And you know what they're concerned about? They're concerned about bureaucratic formula here. You know, they have all the marks of a church or a synagogue that's gotten too big for its britches, has no real concern for the parishioners, but has every bit of concern for their power and their little formulas and their little thing, doing things the way they've always been done. Please, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Former Blind Man, we have opinions about people who open blind eyes. Uh, we now give you your opportunity to give us the proper politically correct response. And the man's going to goof it up. He's not going to come through for him. Verses 18 through 23, a true miracle will often divide. We already saw that. They, but the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. And they asked him, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, And that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age. Ask him. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, or that's why his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. A true miracle. We've already seen the division even among the Pharisees. Now we're seeing this miracle divide even his family. You're the blind man. You've probably heard or are familiar with the comments, with the pain of your parents all these years. Embarrassing to have your son blind, begging. Embarrassing to have questions asked like the disciples asked in the beginning. Who sinned, this man or his parents? People talking about that. His parents must have sinned. These are the parents. And are they thrilled that, he's, can now, that he now has a sight? Look at how they're seeing it, kind of like from a, you know, from a distance. You know, he was born blind. He is our son. We don't know how he can see, and we don't know who did it. Why don't you ask him? You see the division happening right here in the family. And it's exactly what Christ said would happen when he comes. Remember what he said? Luke 15, 20 to 12, 53. The father shall be divided against the son, and the son against the mother. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, against the father. The mother against the daughter. The daughter against the mother. The mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. We see that happening right before our eyes as a result of this miracle. True miracle will often divide. And then number six, true miracles expose frauds and liars. Verses 24 through 34. So they again called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. Starting off with a nice pious comment there. We all agree that God should get the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Now, I want to stop here for just a minute. I hope you can drink in this, this, these next two couple paragraphs. This is really significant to me in all of Scripture. Because as far as I know, this is the only guy, regular Joe, if you will, that told off the Pharisees to their face. The only, the only one I know of. There's only one, and it's right here. 
You want to read about a guy who told off the hypocrites right to the face? It's this guy, right here. He's going to go tell them to pound sand. And it's such a beautiful passage. I really like reading it. Okay, um, here, here we go. Uh, then they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you did not listen. <laughs> Must be thinking to himself now, let's see. I was blind, but you're deaf. All right, anyway, it doesn't, doesn't say that. Okay. Why do, why do you want to hear it again? And here he gets really smart. Do you want to become his disciples? <laughs> Whoa. He, he, he knew what he was saying. You know what he's saying right there? You're not listening to me. If you really want to know, which he knows they don't, but he's really exposing them here. He, he, when he says, do you want to become his, what he's really saying is, you're not listening to me. Why don't you go become his disciples and listen to him directly? That's really what he's saying. He knows they don't care. He knows they're frauds at this point. But he's just going to expose them. This, this guy who was blind for all those years is exposing the hypocrites. Think about it. Think about that next time you think you have to have a seminary degree to know anything. Wow. Then they reviled him and said, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. The man answered and said to them, why, this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. And now it's going to come to a kind of startling conclusion here. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. Now we have to read that very carefully. He says, born blind. Not open the eyes of anyone who is blind. You see, he's, he's zeroing in here on his own condition. There's been cases, of, of course, where, for example, snow blindness occurs. A type of blindness. But you can get over that blindness. But he's not talking about that blindness. He's about born blind. He says, never happened. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins, and you are teaching us, and they cast him out. Oh, there's so much there, we don't have time for it. You see, they had already concluded that he was born in sins because he was blind, right? My friends, we have these discussions all the time. He's obviously born in sins, that's why he's blind. Well, now think about it. Use, use your logical brain here that you're all excited about and think you can reason, get the truth all on your own. Think about it. Well, now he's not blind anymore, so that must mean that he was not born in sins. Right? Simple logic eludes them. The man can see. They're exposed. It's frauds and liars. Let me ask you something. If a healer like Jesus Christ ever really did walk into a faith healing meeting, do you think he'd be welcome? You know what would happen? The real sick people would be healed. And the charlatans and the quacks would be exposed as frauds. <coughs> Believe me, in these faith healing meetings, Jesus Christ is the last person they would ever want to see. They're hypocrites. They have their own agenda just like these Pharisees did. And finally then, Jesus Christ brings it all back to the healing of the real sin problem. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. This is verse 35. And when he had found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into, the world, into this world. He's not talking about the healing at all anymore here, not the eyes. He's talking about a different type of light and a different type of blindness. For judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see 
and that those who see may be made blind. And some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remains. And what he's saying there is, If you think that on your own, that you can figure this thing out, and that you can obey God, and you can keep his commandments, and you can see your way to eternal life, without Christ, you're really blind. And these Pharisees were people who just said, were Moses' disciples were fine without Christ. That's what they said. We have Moses, we don't need Christ. Of course, earlier in John, Moses had said, or Christ had said, if you don't believe Moses, you'll never believe me. If you really do believe Moses, you, do, you would believe me. So the fact of the matter is, they didn't believe Christ or Moses. My friends, we don't have time to look at the passages, but let me just give you a couple passages. We don't have time to look at them. 1 Kings 8, 35 through 40, Solomon's Prayer, where Solomon addresses real sickness. He's talking about the sickness in our souls. Isaiah 1, 1, 1 through 6. Jeremiah 14, 17 through 20. And I ask in conclusion, why is it that we are obsessed with physical healing while ignoring spiritual healing? Why? The answer has to be we don't need spiritual healing because we are at peace with our spiritual sickness. My friends, if we have made peace with our spiritual sickness, we are in deep trouble and on a path to destruction. Two other passages, well, one of the passages, Isaiah 1, 10 through 15, further there in Isaiah chapter 1. My friends, we all want to feel, feel good. But are we concerned about our spiritual sickness? The sins we commit, the thoughts that we have that are, that are ungodly, the responsibilities that we shirk, the jealousy and envy that we have towards our neighbor, the pride that we have that we're better than our neighbor. Just last night, in closing, I was looking at a... Um, a website. Wherein a it's a website of website to help people who are under great spiritual attack, spiritual sickness and death. In this case it was sexual sins, people who are addicted. And this site was talking about that and a man got on there and said I was a pastor for 29 years and he talked about his adulterous affairs and he talked about his times that he spent looking at things that he had no business looking at and the destruction of his family you know what my first thought was I've not been a pastor for 40, 30, 29 years. And I haven't done those things. Spiritual pride. Bite my face. First thought. Shameful. Sickness. That is the pride and sickness. That is the real problem. In all of us and in me at that moment. Are you concerned about your spiritual sickness? Are you at war with it? Or have you made peace with your own spiritual sickness? Shall we pray? We thank you, O oh Lord, for your tremendous mercy to us. That you showed us our sickness. That we ran away from you, but you ran faster. Oh, how we love you for it. Oh, how we thank you for it. And may we never forget it. And may we truly be at war with those thoughts that lift their ugly heads against you and your grace. Those thoughts of unthankfulness, of pride, and of envy, and lust. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.